Associate Dean for Research for the College of Health and Human Science, as well as Professor of Human Development and Family Science at Purdue University. She was previously at um, uh, the, the Chinese University of Hong Kong as a uh, full professor at the Department of Psychology. So Kami is a past president of the uh, Society of SSSR and, and the Society for the Scientific Study of Reading. And now, and she is the founding uh, president of ARWA, the Association for Reading and Writing Asia. Her work uh, focuses primarily on reading and writing across cultures. She also uh, serves on the scientific uh, advisory board for the International Dyslexia Association, IDA. Uh, she is, as I mentioned, very productive, um, has more than um, 250 peer reviewed journal articles and also uh, wrote two um, books. Uh, one is uh, Children's Literacy Development Across a Cultural Perspective on Learning to Read and Write in 2016, and another book uh, on coping with uh, dyslexia, uh, dysgraphia, and ADHD, a global perspective, published in 2019. She also added uh, six books on various aspects of language and literacy. Uh, her current research interests focus on word reading and spelling developments, as well as online assessment and training. So for more information, you can visit her website, kamimcbride.com. Uh, so Kami, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay, Dr. Sun? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for inviting me and thanks to everybody who's here at this talk today. Um, I really appreciate the um, opportunity to share with you. Um, and so I'm gonna talk, try to talk today about um, metalinguistic meta predictors of literacy. Um, and I'm mostly going to focus on Chinese. My interest is really in cross-cultural perspectives um, from a developmental perspective. So I'm a developmental psychologist and I'm not an educational psychologist. And that means that I look at lots of different aspects of literacy, including environments. Um, but I think what I mostly end up doing is looking at predictors of early literacy learning across scripts and languages. So um, I need somebody to allow me to share my screen. <laughs> I hear, good, now I can. Okay, so here it is. Um, so, um, I'm just looking at the top and it says admit. So hopefully somebody else can admit. Okay, so here um, are some of the highlights of longitudinal work that I want to focus on today. And basically this is just an overview because um, I'm really hoping that it stimulates your interests. And so if there's anything in particular I mentioned um, that you would like me to talk more about, we'll have, I don't know, about 15 minutes or 20 minutes to talk about this at the end. So um, I think it's really exciting to think about how could you predict best um, children who might be at risk for reading difficulties in different scripts and languages. Uh, and so as a developmental person, I can look longitudinally and give some insight into that. And the focus um, of my work will be um, particularly on Chinese today. But, um, and, but you know, I'm really interested in lots of languages and scripts. I think Chinese is especially interesting because there's so many variations. There's simplified and traditional. There are different languages. Um, having been in Hong Kong for so long, I've looked at um, you know, how um, kids learn um, Chinese in school using uh, Mandarin and Pinyin, but also um, Cantonese, um, environmental aspects, et cetera. So these are highlights of longitudinal work from a developmental perspective. We can look at change over time. These are just some examples of how you could do that. Um, understanding growth trajectories. Uh, so, is it the case that some people learn faster than others or do you learn really quickly at the beginning and then it kind of um, ends up being um, slower or fixed? Um, one example of that might be alphabet learning. As all of you can imagine, if it's 26 letters of the English alphabet, after you've learned them, there's nowhere to go on that one. Um, so different trajectories have um, 
different um, characteristics. Causality, um, and I, you know, I want to say suggesting causality because if we're just looking at measuring tasks over time, we can't say for sure what causes what without an experiment. But we can um, we can look at these and and think about what it may suggest. And looking at bi-directional associations. So one of my favorite examples of this is anybody who looks at Chinese thinks, um, oh, if you you know not anybody, but lots of researchers have thought. Visual skills must cause um, Chinese reading. If you're good at visual skills, you're probably going to be a better reader. We haven't found as much evidence for that as the opposite, which is if you're a good reader in Chinese, you get better visual skills. So it's really interesting to think about bi-directionality. What causes what or what seems to cause what? So the constructs I'm going to highlight are these. And um, a lot of you, if you're interested in literacy, probably know something about many of these. Um, I probably should have said phonological sensitivity instead of awareness, um, because we're going to focus on different um, levels, but also, for example, um, super segmental aspects of phono phonology. And in Chinese, that's really tone sensitivity to the to lexical tone. I love invented spelling. I want to promote that. Morphological awareness, rapid automatized naming, of course, vocabulary and early language. And I guess here I need to um, stop for a second. And if you're not really into the literacy um, aspects, uh, this may sound funny, but a lot of people think that language and reading or print are the same thing. They're very, very different. I would say I'm an expert on how kids learn to read words and write words, but not necessarily language development. But of course, the reason you are learning to recognize words is ultimately reading comprehension, and that involves a lot of vocabulary. So this one is particularly important. I'm not going to focus on it as much, but it's maybe the most important. And then two constructs that our lab fo has focused on for a few years, one is pure copying and one is delayed copying. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those later. Okay, so here are some examples of change over time <clears throat> from different um, studies that we've done over the years. One study we did asked what metalinguistic skills predict Chinese character recognition up to five years later. And what we found was something that we call invented spelling of pinyin. Um, and when we first did this study, I did it with Professor Shu Hua. Maybe some of you, if you're in, in, interested in literacy development in Chinese, know her work. And um, it took me a great deal of work to convince her to allow us to do invented spelling of pinyin. And so this is just asking children to listen to um, a syllable with a tone attached and to try to write it, whatever they could write, letter, one letter, maybe indicating a tone with a number or a, a figure um, or nothing. Some kids would just scribble. We didn't know if this would work well or not, but um, we found that it worked extremely well, at least in Beijing. And I think that there are implications for identification and training in um, invented spelling opinion that have been done much more recently. So for example, Professor um, Ding um, at Fordham University in New York has done lots of work in Beijing. Um, one example is this paper that I've just listed here on older children to, to show that invented spelling opinion really um, is good at distinguishing those who are dyslexic versus not dyslexic in Chinese. And again, in our original study from 2011, we found that pinyin um, was predictive of um, reading five years later, even with the autoregressive effects of Chinese character recognition at the first time point statistically controlled. So that was quite impressive. Um, and I'm just, again, I'm going through this quickly. And if you're interested in anything in particular, we can go back more slowly. This um, pinyin um, paradigm came from Tangle and Blackman, who had done it in English in the early 90s. Um, and they had one uh, study where they looked at five words that they asked children to write. Um, and, and I did that in the US um, also in the late 90s. And here's an example from one child, the same child three times. 
So again, the words are, the first one is lap. And you can see how she tried to um, indicate lap three times, the third time getting it correct. But you can see that she, you know, her um, depiction there shows that she had some sense of like what an L sounds like. Not as much of about vowels at the beginning, but she got it at the end. Um, the next one is sick. So if you look at the first time point, figure one, that doesn't look too much like the word sick, um, but she did get a C, which, you know, might have something to, some correspondence with the S sound. Elephant, same thing at the first time point, she got the L, right? A lot of children think of the sound as a syllable. So she got the L in elephant. And by the end, she was much closer, spelling it E-L. Um, pretty is uh, the fourth one. And then train. And you can see in the first one, I just love this because it looks like that kind of does look like a train of letters, um, but not much about the spelling. And toward the end, she got it. And that's the way we do it in pinyin as well, except that we also include tone. Um, another aspect of pinyin spelling is this study that we did um, looking at how Chinese, mostly mothers in Beijing, would talk about how to write pinyin with their children. And what we found was um, that when the parents were very focused on speech sounds like phonemes um, uh, or, or rhymes in pinyin, their kids tended to be better at, um, at writing. Okay, so this one is not just about the children themselves, but how parents might scaffold that. And we've done several studies in different scripts, starting with Iris Levine, who did a lot of this in Israel on scaffolding, mother's scaffolding of children's print. Um, another study we did was looking longitudinally at socioeconomic status or SES um, and other variables. And what we found was that SES was sort of interacting with language skills and family reading um, at ages four to five to predict better reading comprehension at age 11. This is that study. This is a little bit of a hodgepodge, but it's a, you know, focusing on various aspects of longitudinal work. What about growth trajectories? We've looked um, in some studies at differing patterns. This is one that we did um, a long time ago, following a big cohort of children and then using mixed modeling, trying to figure out what whether we could categorize children's different groups of learning. So one was a typical group. One was called catch up, which was children who were initially not very uh, relatively low in phonological awareness and also morphological awareness, but who recovered by age eight. Also those who were had a cognitive delay, so they were poor in those skills that I just mentioned and rapid, rapid automatized naming. And so by age eight, they were having problems in literacy. And there was a different group. I think these two, two delay groups should be distinguished because the first one is really metalinguistic skills. And one way, you know, that's kind of vague, but probably, um, accurate in some ways is to talk about meta cognitive cognitive skills as those that children aren't normally doing it's just kind of things we do in tasks we make up tasks to have them um, reflect on the speech sounds in language or um, to, to try to like fluency is rapid automatized naming to identify things very quickly by speaking Whereas language delay is really the language measures those are measures that we use you know it's vocabulary knowledge for example. And so this is what those trajectories look like. Um, and I, you know, I just want to highlight the fact that we looked at lots of different skills and we found um, different patterns. Another aspect of longitudinal work that I want to highlight is about morphological awareness. So probably some of you know um, what I mean by morphological awareness. And we kind of took, um, the structure of Chinese in a way, and I am not an expert in Chinese at all. So um, if what I'm saying doesn't make sense to you, let me know later. But, you know, Chinese has many homophones. So although like in English and some other um, scripts, 
if you're very good at speech sounds and you can map that onto an alphabet or a, a, a series of um, symbols, that's a lot towards recognizing a word. In Chinese, that's not going to get you too far because um, many syllables have five or 10 different meanings. We have that in English too. So like T-O, T-O-O, and T-W-O are all pronounced the same, but they have different meanings. And so to disam you need to disambiguate those, like in a spelling test, you would say um, to, as in today, then you know which way to spell it. Um, and in Chinese, you absolutely need to disambiguate them by making compounds. And so the morphological awareness task that we usually do is to try to get children to use morphemes, which are um, uh, units of meaning in language that they're familiar with and combine them in new ways. So we would say something like, when the sun sets, uh, we call, sorry, when the sun goes down at night, we call it a sunset. What would we call it if the moon went down? And you would make up a word like moonset. Um, and so presumably making use of familiar morphemes, but combining them in new ways. And what we find is that in Chinese, um, this morphological awareness task tends to predict better reading over time. Here's a study where it predicted a faster growth rate in Chinese character reading. Um, and I have, uh, now I'm gonna introduce another construct. Uh, in some ways, I feel like I'm throwing a lot at you, but um, I think it's a good way to talk about lots of constructs. And if there's one you're interested in, we can follow up on it later. Um, one thing that I have been interested in for a long time is visual skills and Chinese. Because when we first started out, we really thought, oh, those people who are better at visual skills should be better in reading Chinese. And our data didn't bear that out too much. And we were very disappointed. Um, and we started to think of other ways where we, we could integrate some of the important skills that are important for um, learning to read and write Chinese, which is probably visual motor in some ways, to notice all the different um, features in different um, char Chinese characters. And so um, one way we tried to emulate this is a, in a, what we call a pure copying task. We did not invent this task. Valentino in the 1970s invented this task because he was interested in whether English speaking kids who are dyslexic would um, write things differently than those who are not dyslexic. So he took American kids who didn't know Hebrew and asked them to write in Hebrew, copy Hebrew. Now they didn't know Hebrew. So it was to them just two dimensional funny lines. He didn't find any difference between those who were and were not dyslexic in this. And so he used that to say that English speaking kids with dyslexia don't have visual problems. We sort of did the opposite. We were thinking, well, maybe there is something that is showing, gonna show variability in learning to read Chinese at the beginning. So we looked at Hebrew, we looked at Korean, which is, so Hebrew is sort of like another alphabet. So it's kind of stringing along symbols. Uh, Korean is sort of like Chinese in that it's left, right, and top, bottom, things that you need to pay attention to. And Vietnamese is written in the alphabetic script, the Roman script, but there are lots of diacritics, funny things to put at the top and the bottom. And, if you, and so we, we looked at how kids would put all of those in. And what we saw, and I think this is quite interesting in terms of script, is that our measure of pure copying was strongly predictive of Chinese literacy skills two years longitudinally. Um, but in the same children, it was not predictive of their English skills. And so we sort of use this to try to say, you know, every script requires some phonological or speech sound and some visual orthographic or, you know, visual skills. But Chinese requires probably more of the visual orthographic skills than, for example, English. This is another interesting study to me that kind of um, is shifting a little bit to context. So um, in these Hong Kong Chinese children, I think this is true for some kids in Singapore as well. It's not uncommon to have a foreign domestic helper. In Hong Kong, a lot of the foreign domestic helpers are from the Philippines and they speak English quite well. Um, and so 
one question of Hong Kong Chinese parents is, does it matter if you have a helper for the literacy skills of your kids? And so what we did was we followed Hong Kong Chinese children um, for five years, and we saw that um, those with a foreign domestic helper who speak, spoke English had somewhat better English and somewhat poorer Chinese um, all the way along with no change in developmental trajectory. So this is, uh, I think, quite interesting in thinking about like literacy learning is not just cognitive linguistic skills or even parents or even teachers, but other aspects of the environment as well. I'm shifting now to examples of causality. And I, again, I put that in quotes because without an experiment, it's difficult to show exactly causal uh, relationships. But uh, we did try to look at um, what would predict dyslexia um, in Hong Kong using 47 at-risk children, and they were at risk for one of two reasons, either their sibling had dyslexia or they were officially language delayed. And um, we also had controls. We tested them at five and again at seven. And what we found was those tasks in Hong Kong Chinese kids that were best in distinguishing those who would end up being dyslexic at, a, um, at age five were morphological awareness, rapid automatized naming and word reading itself. And all three of them were useful. And this is that study in Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. Um, here's another study that we did on what early skills predict word reading and spelling. Um, and what we found um, was that the best predictor of early spelling, and I put spelling in quotes, why a lot of people don't like to talk about writing Chinese characters as spelling. They would like to talk about it as dictation. I think um, you can debate about that, but um, I think in some ways, if you just define spelling very loosely as being able to write a word or character, then it's okay. Um, so, we were particularly interested in another task that we call delayed copying. So this is that study. I already told you about um, pure, what we call pure copying. And um, different reviewers over the years have told me they don't really like this phrase, but I, I call it pure copying because you're copying something you've never seen before. It's equal exposure to to all children. It is like showing Chinese kids who know no Korean, Korean, Hangul, and just asking them to write whatever they see, um, or Vietnamese diacritics. Delayed copying came from Xu Hua, Richard Anderson, um, and a lot of other people in the Beijing group who did something like this in older kids, fifth and sixth graders. We just took that task we brought it down to much younger children and um, we looked at partial scoring. So in my career, I've, I'm very partial to partial scoring. I really like partial scoring. I don't like tasks where you're either right or wrong. I like to see what the task will show about what children understand. So if you go back to the invented spelling task, sometimes children would get one letter right. Sometimes children would just write randomly or draw a picture. Those two different children would be very different in their phonological sensitivities. In this task, coming back to this one right here, delayed copying is where you show children a word or a character that is too complicated for them, that they haven't learned in school. And you kind of flash it at them for a short period of time. And then you see what they can remember, what they can write down. So if you were to do that in English, which is easier for me to describe, what about a word like pneumonia? Pneumonia is spelled with a P. It looks very funny with an N next and all kinds of, it's very long. If you just flash that at a five-year-old, they're unlikely to remember how to write the whole word. But some children might uh, remember the first letter, P, or the last letter, A, or maybe they've seen a digraph like IA together before. Another word like um, conflagration, very complicated word. Some children might remember T-I-O-N as one unit of that because they've been used to seeing T-I-O-N, they recognize that as a unit. 
And in Chinese, you can imagine there are many um, semantic or phonetic radicals. Children might only remember a single stroke, but often they can remember like one of the radicals in a complicated Chinese character. And what we found was that those children who did well in that task, not that they got it all correct because we, you know, we ruled those children out. That would be being able to spell. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about um, partial scoring. Those children who could remember more of what they saw in terms of um, radicals or strokes um, did better in literacy learning. Okay. Okay. So here's another one that in um, might be particularly of interest in Singapore. What skills predict poor reading in Chinese, English, or both? And in the Hong Kong Chinese context, we looked at kids at ages five to nine, and um, there are a lot of findings. But the one I want to highlight here is that those who were poor in reading in both Chinese and English were unique in that they were significantly slower in rapid automatized naming. And they were significantly worse than that, even that those who were poor in either reading of Chinese or of reading in English. Um, and so it kind of highlights, I think that this rapid automatized naming task highlights the importance of automaticity for literacy um, across scripts. And we can talk more about that. Um, there are so many details I'm skipping over. How do you tell who's poor? You know, it's kind of an arbitrary cutoff, but um, we've, we've replicated this several times. So rapid automatized naming, I think, is a great quick and dirty um, task. That, that often does predict um, difficulties in literacy learning for children. And so we pu published that in Journal of Learning Disabilities. Um, so, you know, a lot of what I'm gonna say now is just kind of replicating that. I'm mindful of time. This is another study. So I, I can demonstrate to you that we have replicated several of these results. Um, what skills predict word reading and word spelling in Hong Kong Chinese children from kindergarten on? Uh, well, one thing we looked at at this, this was quite interesting. And I know Beth O'Brien um, in your institute has looked at this as well in slightly older children. We found that word reading predicted word spelling in Chinese, but word writing in Chinese did not predict subsequent word reading longitudinally. And again, we have to be mindful in Chinese that different kids learn different ways. And in Hong Kong, um, they really don't learn or haven't traditionally learned in a, using a pinyin system. It's very much look and say. So we don't know, um, you know, all the implications of this, but this is one thing we found. And then the predictors, best predictors were morphological awareness, rapid automatized naming, and our task that I just described to you called delayed copying, where we would flash a real character at the children um, and see how much of it they could remember and write down. So this is that study and it's much more recent um, on longitudinal word reading and word spelling. I think I'm gonna skip this one. This one's all about dialect. And I love this study because it's Swiss German and high German. I think there are parallels to Cantonese and Mandarin, but um, this is a study that I don't know that we have as much time for. If you're interested in it, let me know. A dialect matters. I am going to, though, focus on this um, study of Korean children. We looked longitudinally at Korean children and what predicted their literacy learning. And I like this study because what we found was that it was a combination of individual skills, like in, in Korean, the coda is important. And I mean, I'm not an expert on linguistics, but uh, I guess coda would be like if you say the word cat. The coda is ca. You can divide cat into ca and t. This is not how we do it in English or really Chinese, but in Korean, it's much uh, more um, normal to do that. And so the ability to do that was a good predictor of reading individually in young children. In addition, maternal mediation, which I had mentioned before in terms of how mothers scaffold their children and speech sounds in pinyin, for example. But this, in this one, it was Hangul. Maternal mediation longitudinally explained word reading as well. So there was a combination of children's individual skills, 
and mothers um, focus on uh, scaffolding their children's writing. Okay, and then the last part is bi-directional associations. Um, one of my favorite studies that we've done was looking at Cantonese, Mandarin, Korean, um, and looking at morphological awareness and vocabulary knowledge. Morphological awareness, again, is that task where you say, okay, there's a word called sunset. What if the moon went down? And you would say moonset, which isn't really a real word. We did the same task in Cantonese, Mandarin, and Korean, and we found that both ways worked. Morphological awareness predicted vocabulary knowledge, and vocabulary knowledge predicted subsequent morphological awareness. And I think that that's important, especially because vocabulary knowledge in general is really the bedrock of reading comprehension. So this is an old study, but one of my favorites. And then I mentioned visual skills. So this is the one study where we set out to show visual skills predict Chinese reading, and we failed. We, we found it a little bit, but we found more the opposite, that reading skills tended to predict visual skills. This one also got me really interested in the difference between simplified and traditional Chinese. And based on a few studies now, you know, people are always debating which is better, simplified or traditional Chinese. Usually the answer is whatever you learned is better. But I think empirically um, from a few studies, um, traditional Chinese is easier to read, surprisingly, because it has more strokes, more ways to distinguish one character from another, and more difficult to write. Okay, this was that study. And, um, oh, look at, look at this. I've gone through all of this. I've gone through all the studies, and now I want to highlight what I think I have learned. And so one is, there are a variety of sensitivities and skills that predict literacy. I have really tried to highlight mostly Chinese, some English, a little bit Korean, um, but it's always the case in every script that phonological sensitivity, speech sensitivity, speech sound sensitivity is useful. Um, but also there are other skills like visual orthographic skills, sensitivity to homophones and how they fit in to words um, and uh, sentences. Um, probably you would just want to weigh them differently in different scripts. So there are lots of things that predict literacy. Environment matters very much. Um, what script you're using in Chinese, simplified versus traditional, what language you're mapping that onto. In Hong Kong, pinyin has not traditionally been used. Um, on the mainland, it's been used all the time. That All those things matter. When you start learning to read and write, do you start learning at three and a half as in Hong Kong? Do you start learning at five or six? What is the role of parents? Um, how do people approach storybooks um, in terms of as a learning tool or, or as a source of conversation or both? Uh, predictions may be different across scripts, even in the same children. That's one of the studies that we have just published um, that I mentioned before on um, uh, pure copying and how it was a much better predictor of Chinese performance than English performance in the same children. Also, there are interactions, socioeconomic status, um, parents, um, scaffolding, all those things. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about my tips. So if I were planning a study right now to look at early predictors of, of Chinese, for example, Chinese reading in children, um, these are some of the things that I think I, I might add more as, as well. Cognitive factors actually testing the children or even their parents to me has yielded better, more var variability. I've seen more variability in kids, been able to predict more than with questionnaires. But that could just be I don't have the right questionnaires yet. But this in general has been my experience. I would pick more short tests rather than a few long tests. Sometimes you can combine tests together. We just published a paper um, last month on um, combining different aspects of vocabulary. Um, so receptive vocabulary where like PPVT, you see four pictures, I name ball and you have to point to the picture that shows a ball versus show one picture, like a picture of a dog and you have to say dog versus um, third aspect, which is expressive vocabulary is what is a towel? 
explain what it is. So these things are all related. You can do short tests of each and combine them together. That's useful for looking longitudinally. Production tasks are important. So asking children to write something down and partially score them is really very useful. That's why I say consider scoring items in multiple ways. Right versus wrong will yield minimal information. If you can um, analyze it in a more linguistic, um, more linguistically creative way, that would be better um, if you can map it to things that make sense in terms of the orthography. It's good to do group tests to, to save time, do pilot testing. Uh, I already said, be prepared to collapse tests like the vocabulary example, you can put them all together. If you're doing literacy tests, consider both speed and accuracy, not just one, especially for either Chinese or English. In some other scripts, it matters much less. For example, in German, by about second grade, children can all read. They're just, the ones who are dyslexic are just much, much slower. But accuracy doesn't matter as much. But in both Chinese and in English, for various reasons, they're both sort of complicated uh, relative to others. Um, speed and accuracy both matter. And I also favor testing parents themselves. If I had to do a study right now and start over, I would think about um, just like uh, identifying a, a short um, set. For example, the letters of the alphabet. That's very useful for three and four-year-olds for subsequent prediction. In one study we did a long time ago in Hong Kong, we found one of the best predictors of Chinese character recognition was letter naming. That made no sense to me. They're not related and children weren't taught pinyin. It, there was no overlap. But I think learning of a some kind of a subset of skills, like a, a small set to identify the um, written um, symbol with something oral is fundamental. Thank you very much. And that is my talk on all of these different skills. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cami. Very, very rich information. Um, okay, so we have about, let's say, 20 minutes for Q&A session. Um, so please, um, I think this, this is a really cherished opportunity for us to ask whatever questions you want. And, you know, I even skipped my, my self-introduction for, for this cherished opportunity. So yeah, um, Colleagues, if you have questions, you can type it down or you can just open your camera and ask a question directly, okay? I think probably some colleagues are typing or you know, preparing the question. So, I oh, okay, jump okay. Right in. okay. That was such a great talk and you have condensed so much wisdom into one talk that I have actually so many questions, but I'm gonna start with this. Um, you spoke about the importance of autonomicity for literacy. So how do you develop this skill, right? As a parent, it'll be really interesting to know how you can get children to like just automatically catch on to sounds or how things look like and, and words. Thank you for your question. I mean, it, this reminds me, you know, at the beginning, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I really highlighted this, but one of the reasons that we want to look at all these different skills is to, to be able to identify children who are at risk for reading difficulties early. That's one reason. But the other is, if we can figure out what of those skills um, predicts reading, maybe we can train them. So I really appreciate your, your question for that reason. And yours uh, makes me think mostly of the training element. And so, um, there are programs that attempt to um, get children to be more fluent by practicing. So I think that this is a this is a good um, way to get children involved, and they sort of enjoy it. You can start with, I mean, if your child is very young and doesn't read anything, um, but can label some pictures, you know, like a ball or a cat or a sun, um, you can you know, first of all, make sure they know what every picture is and then um, get them to say the pictures in order that you present them. 
and time them with your phone or your watch or whatever, and then show them the time and then get them to race themselves and try it again and try to get faster. So competition with other children is completely a bad idea, but competition with the child, with the self, that's okay. And you can move on from um, individual symbols or pictures to, to graphemes, like, you know, one did uh, single digit numbers or letters or simple characters when they learn those, um, to words and to sentences. So practicing over and over again, that seems to be something that children, they don't hate doing it. And some of these tasks, they really don't, they're very boring, but trying to get faster is something that I think children do enjoy and can be helpful. Does that actually mean like flashcards, especially for the Chinese characters? Uh, I'm not a huge fan of, I was, it depends on the age. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm a developmental psychologist. And so I want to tell all parents and teachers to chill out a little bit. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to make the inner, all the interactions with your child about like, did they get the answer right or not? But, um, you know, it, so I would say it's developmentally dependent. If you're really worried about your child um, at a, age five or six, depending on the culture, flashcards can be good. Yeah. I just don't want to, I don't want to promote that too much. I don't want people. Yes. Thank you. It has to be fun. It has to be fun. Yes. <laughs> and if they're not enjoying it, stop. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let us have a turn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Bess, please. I'm sorry, I'm just putting my camera on, I think. Um, thank you very much, Cami, for this talk. Um, I think I have more questions in time, but maybe I'll just ask two brief or sort of brief ones. And again, thank you for summarizing your body of work, which really has inspired a whole lot of us researchers. <laughs> and we, we're still reading some of your, even your original stuff with fresh eyes here. So thank you again for all your contributions. Um, I guess maybe if I could just get thought, your thoughts on two things. One is kind of following up from Pepe, um, with regard to the RAND task, I mean, I've, I've worked with some of the people studying this closely, and I guess there's still questions about, you know, what it tests and and what what exactly are we measuring? Maybe, uh, and maybe that's, I mean, it it is a great screening device, and I agree with you. It's it's something that's very predictive across languages. But I think uh, as we go forward, we're thinking of different ways that maybe we could use RAN types of tasks, and you know, what theoretical um, perspectives we can hang on those. I guess. And then a second question might be your um, your perspective on like the intervention, early interventions with things like pinyin for, for Chinese, learning Chinese with uh, early uh, reading acquisition. If that's, um, I know there's some other alternative ways that people are looking more holistically at character recognition and, and how you train uh, maybe even visual aspects of character rec recognition early on. But I guess uh, is pinyin in your opinions uh, 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 an effective way to, to train early acquisition for Chinese reading. Thank you. Those are two fantastic questions. I don't I don't know that I can answer either of them very well, but I will try. I'll tell you what I think. I mean, one of the things that this that your question about rapid automatized naming reminds me of, by the way, is like I'm very proud of our um delayed copying task, which again we took from Shuhua and Richard Anderson, but we, uh, I think we, um, we made some adjustments that made it useful. It looks useful clinically, it use, looks useful for Chinese, but also at least English as a foreign language and also Korean. We've, we've had good results from that. But the problem is, what is it? And I think I mentioned in my talk, people keep telling me to call it different things. I wanted to call it delayed copying because that's like literally what I think it is. But it involves so many processes like memory, like hand-eye coordination, like phonological sensitivity sometimes. What is it? And rapid automatized naming is absolutely that way. 
So it is a great clinical indicator. And I guess for this one, for this talk, I was more focused on different indicators and what I think might work. But what it actually is, people keep talking about it. Like, so for those of you who haven't seen that task, maybe you, maybe everybody has, but you, you present some symbols, like a picture, like pictures, like ball and sun and cat, or, you know, numbers like one and three and seven, or, and maybe five or six of them. And then you have the kids read them to you maybe several times over as quickly as they can. And if they're slow, that means they might have a problem. So what is it? Is it connecting visual symbols with um, phonological, phonological access, semantic aspects? I am not, I have not committed to, I mean, even pause time. Some people talk about like, it's not really how you articulate ball or cat or sun. It's the amount of time between those that matters. I think it's a combination and I don't know. I am very interested in theoretical aspects. I think that's fundamental. At the same time, the theoretical aspects don't always map very well um, onto the best clinical predictors. For example, like for my own dissertation, I was very interested in verbal memory. Verbal memory is probably implicit in every single thing we're doing. But as a, it's not a unique predictor of reading most of the time if you take into consideration anything else like phonological awareness or what we've just been talking about, rapid automatized naming. So I just want to tell you, it's a great question and I am not very committed to any particular answer. For the second question, it's also a really great question. I had a PhD student named um, Yenling Zhou do a study in, um, international schools in Hong Kong. So in international schools, the medium of instruction is English, but they always have Chinese every day. And the Chinese is Mandarin. It's not Cantonese like um, in the local schools in Hong Kong. So um, she divided the groups into um, kind of kids. This is a very, very rough estimate, but kids with a sort of a foreign mother versus a Chinese mother. And there are too many foreign mothers of different types. So it was very vague, but basically Chinese was one group and it could be any Chinese, whatever background, Singaporean, Hong Kong, um, different, so different languages represented. But her question was whether those two groups, um, because they were going to the same school, often in the same Chinese classes, if their approaches to Chinese would be different. And when we started that study, um, a lot of the teachers were really worried and they said, don't teach pinyin early because the kids will confuse the letter sounds um, from pinyin with English and they'll mess them up and that'll be confusing. I never thought that was a big problem because I think there's a lot of overlap, but this is just an opinion. It's not based on any research. But I came away from that study thinking, yes, don't teach pinyin too early. It's better to teach the Chinese characters first. Why? because maybe a lot of you have experienced this, alphabetic reading is simply easier. Reading the pinyin is easier. So I think that from some of the, from some of the results of her studies, you know, um, kids who learn, who's, you know, whose parents are really focused on the Chinese characters first, they kind of get, um, they absorb that better they, um, it becomes more internalized for them. They, it's easier for them to both read and to even write Chinese characters. Those who learn pinyin first for Chinese often just kind of rely on it all the time. And so that limits their um, Chinese processing. Their visual orthographic skills are not as good. So I guess I'm more strong on that one. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, um, some other questions? Okay, um, I do have a lot of questions. So I, I would like to use the time. Uh, so um, about REN, um, Cami, just you mentioned that um, it's a really good task. 
uh, you identified, and then it predicts children's later literacy development. And also based on uh, Dr. O'Brien's um, previous question, you know, what, what's it? Uh, yeah, what's the theoretical, you know, implication and gap from there? So I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, whether it's run also touch upon language aptitude. So in my uh, very limited studies, I found, you know, something about, you know, memorable intelligence, uh, uh, mem working memory, these uh, subcomponents for uh, younger children's language aptitude, they predict children's later performance in many language and literacy tasks. Um, so I, I personally, I don't use a uh, run, but uh, when I uh, check the definition of the task, I found it touched upon some cognitive elements of children's language learning and literacy learning. So I'm wondering whether, you know, probably the, the, these uh, cognitive components behind run really, you know, play a big role in, in promoting children's learning or predicting children's learning. I'm I'm sure they they do. Um, I think the interesting um, clinical utility of RAN is that it's supposed to focus on well-learned symbols or pictures. So it's never supposed to be a task where you learn what a thing is called and then you have to say it quickly. It should be something that you've already you already know. But yes, uh, it that's why it's so. I mean, Beth's question is a great question. Lots of people ask it just because it involves so many different processes. Um, so yes, nonverbal, um, sorry, verbal memory, maybe some nonverbal skills as well. Yeah. I mean, there are people who argue that, you know, some of IQ is just speed, speed of processing. This one should be, um, again, focusing on well-learned information rather than novel information. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, it involves many different aspects. I just think it's a good, so it depends, you know, in this group, maybe some people are educational psychologists and or clinical clinicians. RAN is really helpful. If you're um, a psychologist interested in the theoretical aspects of it, it's less, I mean, it, it it really will take a lot of um, more studies to untangle exactly what it is. Okay, thank you. So, um, colleagues? Well, one more thing I want to add to that, just theoretically. RAN is interesting because it's very good at predicting both the easiest scripts and languages in the world to read and the most difficult. So it's it's kind of rare to find that, but like, um, German, for example, it's a difficult language to speak, but to read is it's quite consistent. It's a very good predictor of German. It's a very good predictor of English or Chinese. So it's equally useful. And so what fluency is, is I mean, I think it's, it, I think in part it is just fluency. Okay, super. Thanks, Cami. Um, so colleagues, any other questions? Um, oh. Angela mentioned something. Yes, RAN has been con consistently found to be predictive of literary skills. Yeah, thank you for your comments, Angela. Uh, okay, so. Uh, uh, I do uh, have a question if um, we still have some yeah, time please. left. Um, so thank you, um, Dr. McBride, so much for your talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm just curious to find out more about um, one particular study regarding the German and the Swiss children. Um, so then I see that um, the findings of that study was that um, Swiss German speaking children are generally better in literally, literacy skills in kindergarten, but not better in reading or spelling at grade one. So I'm just wondering like, why is there this difference between you know Swiss German speaking children and German German speaking children? Yeah, right. Thank you for your question. So I brought that study up because I think there are a lot of parallels, like in Hong Kong, Cantonese speakers, but also learning Mandarin. So both are Chinese, but they're very different. So high German um, is spoken in a lot of well in schools in Germany. Um, but Swiss German is more like a dialect and it's what people speak in their homes. And so that study was looking at um, kids where it was consistent in school um, and at home or not consistent in the languages. And so basically 
the kids learning Swiss German at home, but speaking high German um, had better phonological awareness skills like than those kids who only had high German all the time. And this is, I think, quite interesting because it, it demonstrates something about sort of bilingualism, sensitivity to different speech sounds and how it's helpful to you in, in being in metacognitively aware, aware that there are different speech sounds and they can be manipulated in different ways. However, the kids who were speaking Swiss German at home did not do better in spelling at grade one. I would have loved to have followed them over a longer period of time because um, pro presumably from what we know about bilingualism and diglossia, you know, di speaking different variations of the same language or similar languages, it you usually you get better over time. Um, but um, that study was interesting because it showed that initially your phonological awareness skills were actually better. Um, it's not that you got worse um, in the next grade level, but you you weren't better than your your peers who were only learning to spell in the language that they were hearing. You know, so there's a big difference between what you you know if you hear something that's very different from what's um, uh, sorry, if you speak a language at home that's very different from what is mapped onto print at school, it can be problematic in some ways. And this study shows that those kids actually were doing okay. So thank you for your question. I'd be okay. happy to answer more. I know that's like complicated. I also saw that Beth wrote another question um, and just in answer to her, her question, cause she was asking if we use the same stimuli. We ask children, Hong Kong Chinese children in particular, but also in Beijing, um, just to have the same stimuli, single digit numbers, use English when they're speaking in English, use Chinese for Chinese, um, and letters would be the same um, in Hong Kong. You just call them the same thing. So there, we tried to make them as similar as possible. Thank you. Okay. Um... Even though we probably have a lot more questions, but now time's up. Thank you so much, Cami, for your precious time with us this morning. I, I think all of us really enjoy your talk and I can't thank you more. Okay, so um, so colleagues, uh, I think if you have other questions, uh, maybe you can email Cami separately. And um, now I can introduce myself a little bit. My name is Sun He and um, chairperson of bilingualism SIG this year. So SIG means special interest group of NIE. So um, we are going to uh, launch more interesting talks and I think about literacy, about bilingualism. And uh, if you want to follow us, um, please fill in our feedback form so we can know how we can serve you better next time. And so I think that's the end of the study. So we also, I also want to thank uh, Nat, uh, my colleague who you know helped the admin work today. So Nat, if you, you're okay, please turn on your camera. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I think Nat will show you uh, the slide about you know the QR code where you can do the feedback. So everyone, thank you very much. I think uh, now is the end of the talk. See you next time, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. McBride.